Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Rob Baskitza. Rob is the managing editor of Boing Boing and the founder of txt.fyi, an effectively invisible publishing platform and low-key internet cult. Hey, Rob, how's it going? It's going great. How are you doing, Mark? Doing really well. It's really great to catch up with you, Rob. Hi, Ken. So, Rob, you are like a really creative person. I've known you for many years now, and you wear a lot of different hats at Boing Boing. You're a wonderful artist and painter. Thank you. You code things. You do a lot of, you're, you're a great writer. And um, so you're a very interesting person. So I know you're going to have some interesting tools to talk about. I took a little peek at them. Um, yeah. One of the things I know, you love um, mechanical keyboards and mm -hmm. actively have been like searching for the best one ever. So tell us about your first pick, the Vortex mechanical keyboard. Well, mechanical keyboards, the appeal is in the old fashioned key switches, which have a more tactile, more clicky feel to them. And there's all sorts of different types that you can get depending on your preferences. Uh, it's just great for people who type a lot or ju who just don't like modern keyboards who are, or who are getting sick of butterfly keyboards from Apple. Or, um, and a, so I think anyone, anyone who listens to a tech podcast will be familiar with the cult of mechanical keyboards. Um, a big part of the appeal is that you can swap out the keys. So there's a cottage industry of keycaps in all sorts of different color schemes and styles. So you can have a keyboard that looks like an old typewriter or one that looks like a very specific 8-bit computer that you had 30 years ago or that looks like a nuclear missile launch silo console. <laughs> cool. So and Vortex is one of the, the brands. And um, its thing is that it makes offbeat sizes and includes Bluetooth, um, which is a relatively uh, rare feature in mechanical keyboards. Mm. Um, so, so they make these like tiny little 40 key keyboards that will fit in a shirt pocket, or you can get these huge sprawling 100 key keyboards with a condensed or otherwise bizarre layout. Um, the one that I picked, which I would guess is like the the official pick for this tool, is the Vortex Tab 75. And uh, this has all the keys that you get with a 10 keyless keyboard, so it doesn't skimp and make you learn weird shift levels or anything like that. Uh, but there's no spaces at all between any of the keys, including the arrow keys and the page up, page down stuff. So it has this extremely compact layout not much larger than a magic keyboard, um, but you get all the benefits that you would get from a mechanical keyboard. You can have it with clicky keys, you can have it with tactile keys, you can have it with the linear ones that gamers like. Um, and of course you can make it look any way you like. And so the main advantage for you is the, the travel that the key does um, by being physical, you like that that feel it's not really the sound you're after it's the feel of the key moving yeah that's it and, and just the general snobbiness of mechanical keyboards <laughs> just knowing that i'm participating in 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 the in keyboard elitism i see um well, that only works if you are kind of traveling with it, so you can show it off right right well i guess you you, you can post People who have mechanical keyboards always have Instagrams for their mechanical keyboards. The way other people, like the way people with, it's like children and pets. But uh, okay, um, but no one ever has to grow up. There's no, there's no, there's no like bezel around it or anything. It just looks like keys glued together. I, I kind of like that look. Right, and like one of the things I like doing is like. Um, if you kind of look on Boing Boing, there's an old post I did for one of them. I think it's the Vortex 40, uh, where I'd made a custom wood surround for one of those types which have no bezel. So it looks like the keyboard is kind of made out of wood, like 
something from the 1970s. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess you could substitute wooden caps. I'm sure that they must be available. Oh, yes. Yes, there's wooden caps. There's metal caps. Uh, people make caps out of epoxy. Um if you kind of do kind of do a bit of poking around in the mechanical keyboard subreddits, uh, you'll find all sorts of crazy things that people have made to go on their keyboards. Um, there, there is a certain like they're not mass-produced gadgets. It's the same way that say a Logitech keyboard is, um, and in fact many like. I think the biggest part of the community is really into like group buy stuff. So that's where you all get together a couple of hundred people to buy a particular model and then you capitalize it together, almost like a Kickstarter campaign, but it's structured slightly differently. And, uh, and you have to wait a year <laughs> for the damn thing to turn up. Rob, one thing I noticed is when you buy one of these keyboards, it comes with keys to swap in depending if you have a Windows machine or a Mac. Yes. Yeah, it's a bit, even so, I think a, a Mac keyboard has like three keys on the bottom row to the left of the space bar. Some, some mechanical keyboards, it's very difficult to make them play nicely with Mac in a way that you'll have muscle memory, the same as you would with a normal Mac keyboard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this particular model does have the, the standard layout, so you shouldn't have too much trouble with it at all. Okay. And... um. I guess the main thing is that you you're you're kind of optimizing, selecting, modification, personalizing something that you spend a lot of time with most days physically touching. So why not make it something that you enjoy touching? Yeah, it it seems like like it's about 120 bucks, which seems like a lot of money for a keyboard, but it's the thing you interact with every day and if you're a writer you should do something which, which is fit exactly to your preferences. Uh, it, you know, people will think they won't think twice about spending two thousand dollars on a new computer or, even, or five hundred dollars on a fancy monitor. But the idea of spending more than thirty dollars on a keyboard really winds some people up. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. So, yeah. so speaking of peripherals on your desk, the other thing you want to recommend is a is a certain kind of a mouse, a Logitech mouse. It's the Logitech MX Vertical Mouse, and um, I have a little bit of repetitive strain type trouble in my right hand, and it doesn't affect. Have you looked it. at your keyboard recently? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> it's never been keyboarding has never been the trigger. The trigger has always been using a mouse. And it's kind of the back of the hand, and it's just the particular way my hand stretches. So if I was smart, I would probably adopt better posture and like hold the mouse in a more ergonomic way. Uh, but why do that when I can just buy something? And the, what I bought <laughs> was a vertical mouse. And the idea here is the mouse is in a peculiar shape, which means that it's almost like a handshake um, posture rather than a hand flat on the mm. table posture. Yeah, much and more I, I tr- natural feeling. But- right. So I tried a cheap one and probably, well, I don't know what brand it was, so I, so I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it stopped working after two weeks. And um, there's a brand name for Vertical Mice, I guess the company that kind of came up with the concept. Um, but but it, it has the feel and look of medical equipment. <laughs> I think it's... I think it has that kind of vibe to it, and they're like two hundred dollars. Um, so Logitech has muscled in on this field in the last year or so, and um, it has all the features and the stylish look of the brand. So I'm giving it a go, and t- I have got to say, I-, I found it very difficult to get used to it. With the cheap one, I spent so much time just getting it working and then it not working that I never really figured out whether I actually liked using a mouse where I'm holding it like I'm shaking someone's hand. And um, the big problem is it it just seems very difficult to be precise with it, at least mm-hmm. for me. Um, but I'm giving it a go, and it, it has instantly made all the pain go away uh, without sending me to a trackpad or 
a stylus or some other control system that I don't want to use. I mm-hmm. want to use a mouse. So I'm, I'm having a good time with it. What do you use when you're painting in Photoshop? Oh, I use an Intuos, a, an Intuos oh. tablet. Oh, okay. Um, uh, eventually, I'll probably get a Cintiq, mm-hmm. but it's like the, the good ones are fifteen hundred dollars. And yeah, uh, I had a Cintiq which I actually sold because I didn't use it enough. Um, but part of it was the um, the difficulty of switching back and forth. Uh, you know, it was two things on my la- la- uh, desktop. It was it was so huge, and it was it was one of the early models. Um, but I so I went back to the little tiny, you know, the graphite ones. Those little, they're only eight inches or something and i found that a better compromise for the amount that i was using it maybe if i was using it every day it might might the cintiq might make sense one of the problems i have with um the wacom cintiq is i've used an ipad pro with a pencil and the latency is so low that when you go back to a cintiq or at least maybe the previous generations models i can't say that the say the, the new ones are the same there's just that slight latency and it's very difficult to go back to it. Um, and I, so I find that with the with the Intuos, where it's a separate tablet from the screen, that my brain naturally accepts a bit of latency um, because it's not the because I'm not writing or not painting on the same surface where I'm seeing the result. So I, so I think that that might be one of the things in the tablet's favor as opposed to uh, Cintiq. And and why don't you just continue to use your iPad instead of even going back to a, a tablet peripheral? Well, because it doesn't have Photoshop on it, and it's uh, got it's going to. Um, but um, I, I have a kind of a, a complicated blogger workflow in that I'm always swapping between different apps and tabs and so on. And it's very difficult to kind of create and maintain that workflow on an iPad. Th- things are probably changing now. I know there's a new version of iOS that's especially made for the iPad coming out. Um, and I think the newer iPad Pros, this year's models are more powerful and um, generally feel better when you're trying to multitask. Um, and they, they also have a very kooky file system abstraction um, they were always made to be like highly secure mobile devices, whereas I think most of us like to just have a pile of files on our desktop or, or shuttled through folders. Whereas, so you can't do that with iPad apps. iOS has everything kind of sequestered in its own secure thing, and they don't. And they and the only access they have to one another's files is through a an API in the system, and it's it's really complicated to get used to. My my unfair summary, or, or or is is that the you know the iOS is for consuming and you know and the, and the OS is for producing. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. just a bias there that um, it's easier to create in this kind of environment of the desktop, and it's wonderful to consume in the iOS. That's a good yeah uh, yeah generalization for sure. Rob, Rob, just a quick side question: Have you ever tried the the uh, um, iPad app called Procreate for doing your painting and drawing. Yes, that that's the one I really love. I really love using Procreate. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just great. I also like. Um, uh, it's blank from my head, but there's another one. Affinity is the other okay. one. Sorry, that I'm really into, um, or was as long as I could cope with trying to work on an iPad. I can't believe Procreate's only ten dollars. I know it's got to be tough to be. Uh, business selling apps on the iPad, yeah. just the, the down mm-hmm. pressure on app prices. And so, um, going back then to the vertical mouse, um, the idea is that there's like a, you have a scroll wheel, and how do you click? Is it with your thumb or with your fingers or? There's um well that's the thing it, it it's like a mouse on its side but because you've got the thumb on the other side you can kind of click underneath it too so there's two extra buttons underneath um, I found it pretty difficult to get used to and I'm not sure I'm used to it yet um, but but because the pain has gone away I'm going to persist and 
I, I had some pain earlier on and I just switched hands. Um, and that, you know, that's a challenge because I'm right handed. So I just, I, I'm still today right now using, uh, I use it in my left hand and, um, being kind of ambidextrous, kind of you can give the other hand a rest. Um, and I found it kind of easier just to switch hands than to switch a mouse. <laughs> mm. That's yeah, cool that I, you can do that. Are you like at the point where you feel comfortable with it? Oh yeah, yeah, That's totally. Cool. I mean, yeah, uh, it's my na it's kind of my natural thing mm -hmm. now. I just automatically go to left hand. I don't know why. I never I never had any trouble in my left hand, so I just kept it there. I can go back to the right if I need to. That's it. That's interesting. It was like the, the artist Frank Frazetta when he had a stroke and the right side of his body was paralyzed. So he just switched to his left hand and taught himself <laughs> to paint over, again. Just, yeah. It took a little while, but he got, it was great again. Yeah. Okay. So what's another one, Rob? What's um, on? Next on the list is a, I've got, um, am I allowed to say naughty words? It's a yes, cheap, of course. A cheap ass Japanese pulse. Or right. That's these. the uh, technical name. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I think the, they're called Ryoba. Ryoba sores. And oh, they, Ryoba. And so they, I, um, I, I pulled up one that, uh, looking at Amazon, the cheapest ones they have was about 19 bucks. Yeah, that's it. I got one that's 25 bucks. Getting one of these liberated me when it came to making things out of wood. Can and, you describe um, it, what it is, how it's it, different? It's, um, it's a saw which has a long, thick um, blade with two sides and one side has teeth for rip cuts and the other side has teeth for cross cuts. So for going against and with the grain on a piece of wood and the way it's designed, it, it you, you apply pressure on the pull rather than the push. And this means that the, uh, the saw is always flex is always straight rather than threatening to bend. Mm. So it doesn't require expert technique the way Western saws do to actually get quality results. A complete idiot can do fast, accurate cuts with one. Right. It is. It is sort of weird that we have the, we being you know America, the West, saws that cut on the push because it just makes so much more sense to cut on the pull. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it was a revelation to me. Like a, I'd uh, I've got a. a a baby son uh, who is now almost two years old and he got to the stage where he's running crazy around the house constantly and he managed to headbutt our ancient victorian era radiators which and the, and he was okay but it was immediately obvious that the design of these radiators with the metal sharp edges just absolutely lethal so i wanted to so i was decided okay i'm going to get radiator covers the wood ones that you buy but because they have to be custom made to whatever size your radiator is, um, they they cost like two or three hundred dollars each, and I've got like a house full of these things. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to buy the wood, at the lumber yard, and get a decent saw and just cut everything and just do rudimentary, straightforward ones myself. And um, and it's so difficult to get precision. I'm getting frustrated. It's slow going, and someone just told me just buy one of those cheap. Japanese saws off of Amazon, you'll be amazed. And I was, I was absolutely gobsmacked. Suddenly I'm like doing all these fancy cuts and everything like that and making radiator covers that look really nice rather than just boxes. Uh, and it's all for $25. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, they are. They are and they are, and sometimes you can get versions of them that have a very thick, Th they're very thin so that the kerf, which is the the cut, the width of the cut, is very, very narrow, which can increase the precision when you're doing woodworking. Um, so that's another option is to have, there's probably more expensive versions of these that have a very thin blade. Yeah, it's very easy when you start looking online, I need to buy a decent saw, start Googling things like that you know, the, the Reddit people will direct direct you to these unbelievably expensive European <laughs> like back saws with incredibly fancy designs. Yeah. No, get the Japanese one from Amazon. Yeah, and, they're, and I think they're called um, Ryoba yeah. is 
the Japanese general term, not, not a brand term. That's a general term for these two-sided pull saws. That's a good one. So, Rob, I'm, I'm intrigued by this one. I, I took a peek. Um, it, it's a it's an Apple iMac, but it's not the latest and greatest. No, the 2006 17-inch iMac. I think these were only made available to schools, but they're widely available on the internet. And why would you want a almost 15-year-old uh, computer at this point? If, if you write a lot and you're not very good at focusing, maybe have a little bit of the attention deficit about you, which a lot of us writers do have, especially when the writing is on deadline. You want something which lets you focus, uh, but which isn't completely ridiculous. So there's a whole cottage industry, almost like the keyboards, of gadgets for focused writing. And likewise, there's all sorts of apps to help you do focused writing. I don't think the apps work because you can just close the app and go back to YouTube. <laughs> I don't think the gadgets work because they're all really expensive and and just hinky, weird things that, that yeah. encompass an idea but don't really have much to them. Yeah, they're kind of overly precious. The, right. So you may as well just use a typewriter and, and scan it in or something or an alpha smart or one of those things. What I love, but in all those cases, it's basically, it's a barbaric thing loud and and doesn't and doesn't have any features at all an old 2006 17 inch iMac is a nice small computer which has all the useful features of um, of word processing software some basic internet access if you need to look things up um, but which is too slow and too primitive to do anything with but right um, uh, I don't think it can even play YouTube videos because you can't install software with the new codecs and all that stuff. Um, and it's great. It's like a focused write. It's the focused writing machine you've always wanted. If you're the person who's looking for a focused writing environment and, and you just, you just got to think about it laterally a bit, a 2006, 17 inch iMac, hundred dollars on Craigslist. So if you were going that route, which I, which I fully understand and, and can, um, and back, why wouldn't you go for like a really old laptop so you'd also have the portability aspect as well? Well, you could. I mean, in a sense, it encompasses a whole category of machines, something which is modern enough to write on and which has some reasonable software and internet access, but which doesn't have all the things that will distract you. Um, so, so an old laptop would be pretty good. What I like about the 17-inch iMac is it's really tiny, um, it's fixed. It's fixed in place. I think it being a desktop is an advantage, at least for me, because it means I sit down in a particular spot and I'm writing. I'm not somewhere out in the world um, thinking about other things. And I know that that's just um, you know everyone has their own personal culture of productivity, and but that's what appeals to me: the fact that it's a desktop. And um, this is. I mean, I'm looking at this website, Blink. B L I N Q dot com. It's seventy five dollars for a refurbished one, and the shipping is free. It was like ninety four percent off the original price when it came out. Ninety four percent. That's great. <laughs> there, there is a certain cultishness to it. Um, I think I found a few other people that like this particular model because if you look at, if you kind of search for it, you'll find people who have figured out the fastest chip that will go into the motherboard inside it and um but that's isn't that defeating the entire purpose you just stated which is that it can't do all these other things well here's the deal um it's so old that it can't that most models except the very final generation like the late 2006 models only have um a core solo intel cpu which can't run the 64-bit versions of OS X. Um, so if you replace the CPU, you can put like, you can get it running Mojave. Um, although I don't know if you'd really want to from such an old chip. 
Whereas if you don't upgrade it, you're stuck with Snow Leopard. And and frankly, even with everything I've said, it is a bit of a pain in the backside to be stuck with Snow Leopard because you have to hunt down old versions of Firefox, old versions of Write Room or whatever your word processor of choice is. And um, you have to stop it from trying to update them, all that, all that kind of stuff where you, you're trying to freeze frame a machine in time because everything these days wants to update, update itself until it's broken. I can smell an opportunity for some side hustle of a guy who's buying these and then doing all that hard work of installing, mm. uh, pre-installing uh, the word processor and everything you need so you have a usable writer's platform on this thing and they ship and he ships the whole thing ready yeah that would be perfect that, that, a guy did that with those old tandy uh kind of word processors that look like a keyboard with a little lcd display attached to them all right so i'm giving the idea away yeah. go ahead <laughs> internet <laughs> just, just steal that one there's um another there's a similar device called the alpha smart which is more like a laptop and uh, i think that's probably of all these this kind of thing that i'm talking about here that is the cult device and there's definitely a few guys who have who like make a living re polishing these things up and preparing them for sale on ebay i had one somewhere which i never could use because it doesn't really have a screen it has well it has a screen that shows like five lines of mm -hmm. text yeah i hate them so it was very, very unuser friendly from my point of view. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't write them. I would be much preferred to, to to use an old laptop that you know could at least boot up Word. Yeah, and then you want to be able to get it off somehow or other. So that you know, it have a modem. I don't know what you would do with that. Uh, One thing I would recommend to people is um, they're hard to find now, but the NEC Mobile Pro was um, one of those Windows CE gadgets that were briefly, I don't know if they're really popular, uh, but companies bought them by the by the thousand for a while, so they, they had their time. And the NEC Mobile Pro is like a, it's like a, a nice keyboard with a screen in the aspect ratio of a keyboard, almost like a CinemaScope screen. And um, it's a little clamshell laptop. It's instant on when you open it, even though it's ancient. And it has one app on it, and it's Microsoft Office, and um, <laughs> and so so that, that that was pretty good. But I think at this point, it's so old that it would probably require a little bit of hacking to get it to get stuff on and off of it, like work. So, Rob, in the few minutes that we have left, tell us about this uh, web-based uh, app that you've created called txt.fyi. All oh, right, so. Everyone in the last couple of years has been reacting against the sort of pervasive and invasive qualities of social media and publication stuff. And I think people were kind of, there were a few platforms which had come about, which people got a bit disappointed in as they pivoted from one model of publishing to another. And, you know, and everything's complicated. You couldn't just go online and just publish something and then share a URL. There was always, some complexity there's always um tracking and all sorts of other things that you would um um that would get in the way of it and then there'd be likes and sharing systems which would kind of fill you with anxiety about how popular what you were publishing was so i just went online uh, or just created something where people can go online hammer out some text hit publish and it's published you don't have to log in um there's no social media social capital stuff none of that stuff and you can use markdown or plain text and um it's like hundreds of things are published on it a day even though there's virtually no public discussion or profile over it apart from a uh, uh, someone at wired fig figured it out and um wrote an article about it and um and so the idea is that when you hit the publish button the text is then posted on the web. Mm -hmm. It has a URL, yep. which you can share. Is that the idea? You can share if you want to, but it's not syndicated anywhere. You're the only person right. who knows it exists. Right. But the word publish means to share. So at some level, you are publishing it to share it, right? And so um, it, there is a shareable URL that you yes. can pass around. Sure, you can. You, it's, 
but it's not being promoted on its own. It, it would depend on you publicizing exactly. it. Exactly. You would have to publicize it on another medium. So to share what you have published on text FYI, you would have to publish something else somewhere else. Sure. Like uh, your followers or your, your WhatsApp or yeah. something like that. So it kind of functions as a paste bin type thing, but with a very, a very strong sense of what it is. And um, presumably, I mean, the the, the um, if I was a, a writer putting, and I didn't have anywhere else, and I was just kind of writing there, my question would be, well, how long is this going to be around? Will, um, will this be around in five years? And if it was to go away, would I? ever know it or was a you know what are you doing about that the only thing between um text fyi and annihilation is me uh, so so it's a tr so there is a trust element of that in that when you're doing it you're you're the in a sense i am publishing it which is uh -huh. um but i don't Good think that's values. necessarily <laughs> a bad thing uh, one of the things that, that made me want to do it was frustration at how complicated federated publishing is. Well, the, a lot of the new social media and publishing environments have an extremely complicated distributed vibe to them, which is very appealing to nerds and especially ones like us who are interested in privacy and trust. But um, it's completely... Um, impossible for grandmas and people who just want to write little notes to themselves that they can compile on their desktop later it's not a wonderful thing i was like i says on the page it's the dumbest platform dumb, the <laughs> dumbest platform and it is uh but but some people just want a just works dumb publishing platform and so that's what it is um, it costs even with the volume of posting, which which is probably I mean it's nothing compared to anything else. But even with plenty of people using it, it costs me about ten bucks a month. Um, I was very careful. Well, everything is published as a as a plain HTML file. There's no JavaScript. There's no so there's not even a database. It's so simple. Uh, although the file system is a database technically. So if someone forgot the URL of a piece of text, it's too gone. bad. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> uh, you know, in truth, a couple, can Google find it? No, it's all I've. Well, uh, if there was like a hostile search engine that ignored um, the yeah, no cache and, uh, and yeah. you published the URL to somewhere like on Twitter, then yeah, I know that there's at least two people out there who are compiling known text FYI pages. Uh, but they've got, you know, they've got like 40 because that's as many as people have ever pu posted about publicly. Um, and the, there's like, uh, there's actually like 40 gigabytes of them. Wow. wow. So, so yeah, so this is sort of, I, I like the idea of a kind of a very private type of publishing, yeah. which is also what it just generates is that you somewhat ability where you can actually, um, share things that sort of are private just by. Mm -hmm the nature of where yeah they are. I, I don't cool. even know what's on it i just look in now and again to make sure that it's not being um conspicuously abused um uh and so sometimes you'll see i'll see what someone's just written because i'm looking through the logs or whatever um but those logs are very short it's like um it's just a, a functional thing for that you know looking at what that the server you know just the default from a server. And to be honest, I should get rid of that because the whole thing, I like the idea of there being no record of anything at all other than what, what people know themselves. Um, so if I was, um, if I were to take the time to revise it, I would maybe have someone configure a, a custom web server and, um, and an operating system that kept no logs at all. Although I guess, I guess in that, I guess that starts to look a bit suspicious at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, d I don't know. I just, I, I think if, uh -huh. if one of the things is it's so useless that <laughs> the spammers don't have any use for it. Uh, <laughs> harassers don't have any use for it. Uh -huh. um, if there's been, there are a few, a few spammers will use it the way they use paste bin. Um, but even even then, it's 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 so unfit for any purpose but 
but personal right. notes or sharing a few words with other people. Uh -huh. Have you ever thought of of like link having the storage be like a cooperative storage cloud of some kind where it's, you know, networked online storage and um that way you you even if uh you t shut off your your storage servers people could still use it that that's that's a really good idea and it's probably what i should do next um rather than just right so it's no longer not depend on even on you it's just kind of as right. long as somebody's interested at all it'll continue well that's the thing the whole thing is such a tiny there's, there's almost no code to it it's just one mm -hmm. one file um, so cool. Any anyone who is a competent programmer could make this themselves. When it, like when it blew up on Hacker News, um, someone said, "I could make this in a weekend," as they do, and I had the pleasure of saying, "I made it in three hours." <laughs> <laughs> but, Which is, but, yeah, and then you made it, and he didn't too. Yeah, so. yeah. Exactly. So. So and that's the that's the if there's a magic to this, it's that no one wants this. <laughs> there's there's no possibility of making money from it. Um, in a, in a vague way, it's always a lurking anxiety that you're responsible for it, and you, I never see what people do with it. I, so I get no pleasure from any kind of social activity or the creative work of other people that other people are doing on it. So the only reason. It, ha it doesn't exist more widely is because no one wants it, no one likes it, and no one can imagine creating anything like it. <laughs> That's perfect. Right. Well, thank well, you well. for <laughs> taking time to make such an unwanted thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Rob, this has been great talking to you as usual. It's always a pleasure to, to find out what you're up to. All right. Yeah. Thanks, it guys. Was, it was wonderful and great tools, too. Thanks. Thanks.